Welcome everyone. My name is Elizabeth Heater and just to make sure that you know that you're in the right place. This is the Kairos Atlantic Fall Gathering. Our title for our gathering this evening and tomorrow afternoon is Good Intentions, Unintended Consequences, Acknowledging Racism in Canada and in Ourselves. Uh, I'm new to PEI. I've, my partner and I moved here from British Columbia uh, and we arrived here in PEI on uh, September the 1st. And uh, when I arrived, I decided I had been involved in Kairos and other places and decided I wanted to get involved here. So I contacted Kairos and Shannon communicated with me and said, this is happening. Do you want to be a part of it? So I said, yes, and here I am. And it's been a great uh, gift to me to be able to be part of the planning team for this particular gathering. Um, earlier today, someone made a note, sent a note and said, this is going to be a powerful weekend. And I think she's right. I think we're going to be um, challenged in ways that we don't even know yet in our thinking and in our, perhaps even in our decision-making around how we want to be in our world. The topic is absolutely uh, timely. And so uh, I know that uh, we are going to be um, gifted by listening to our panel and engaging with one another uh, in conversation. Just a couple of notes as we journey. Uh, I'm wondering if we could ask each of you to put your particular name and your location and the territory that you are living in, in the chat so that everyone will, in, as a means of introducing yourself to the rest of us who've gathered this evening. Um, if you also would um, be so kind, if it works for you to uh, put your particular pronouns in that either where your name is or in your chat, introduction to us, that would be wonderful. Um, just a couple of other notes for us as we journey this evening. Um, before we close our time together, uh, we're going to offer um, us a couple of questions that uh, we are asking that we carry overnight with us and bring back to um, our gathering tomorrow. Um, and uh, we will have opportunity as we learn and unpack what it means to be allies uh, what, and working together, we may have opportunity to um, share some of those thoughts with one another. So. Welcome, and uh, I turn our gathering into the capable hands of, Sh I think it's Shannon is who's going to talk to us about some Kairos events coming up. Thanks, Shannon. Actually, I am Diane Kleimenhaek, and I'm part of the planning team. And in gatherings such as this, it's a sign of respect to recognize that we are living in and working on land across Canada, which is the traditional land of a whole host of nations. In Atlantic Canada, where this gathering originates, these nations include the Wallistake, the Passamaquoddy, the Abenaki, Penobscot, the Mi'kmaq, the Inuit, and the Innu. Here where I'm sitting is Mi'kma'ki. We try to honor the treaties of peace and friendship 
And I know we're not all on treaty land, but some of us are, so we honor that. We who are settlers here realize that we have not always been respectable guests on this land or acted with justice and fairness, but we want to acknowledge with gratitude our hosts who are the original peoples of this land. We are also grateful to our creator who has placed us here to share this land, to work towards reconciliation and peace, and to be good stewards of the land which sustains us and gives us life. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diane and Elizabeth. Um, my name is Shannon Neufeld. Uh, you will have seen my uh, territorial acknowledgement in the chat as well as I sit here on the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant Territory. Perhaps one of the few in the group who is not from the Atlantic. Um, I come uh, as a staff person from Kairos, the member relations and network coordinator. So I thank you for your welcome into this gathering. And I bring some invitations to you all. I um, wanted to, you to know that there are many things going on nationally at Kairos. And I want to share a little bit of information with you. So I'm going to um, first put one uh, note in the chat. I'm having a, there we go. To let you know that this particular link is a great place to find out information about uh, Kairos events. And I wanna share a few that are happening in November with you. So I'm gonna share my screen here. So I wanted to let you know that uh, about a new, relatively new initiative called For the Love of Creation. It is a coming together of faith groups uh, to work on climate justice. And For the Love of Creation, Kairos is um, one of the founding members of For the Love of Creation. Um, and there are many churches and church uh, churches and religious groups and religious organizations that have come together um, all to work on uh, how we can express our love of creation and how we can advocate faithfully for creation. And I'm going to show you one more thing on the Kairos website, if this will move fast enough. Um, there is a relatively new page that is called Advocacy and Campaigns, Current Actions. And here you will find a summary of current and ongoing actions. There are some petitions you can sign here, some active petitions about human rights in the Philippines and full implementation of the peace accord in Colombia and some ongoing long-term work in the Open for Justice campaign work that began this summer for the migrant workers, status for all and landed status now, and so on for some, a number of different campaigns. So I'm going to encourage you to um, check out that page as well. And I will just put this link in the chat as well. And encourage you to look at those two sites and um, join in where you can to the various activities that Kairos as uh, a coalition across the country um, is working towards. And thanks very much for your time and attention. And I believe I'm passing this back to Elizabeth for a moment. So good intentions, unintended consequences, acknowledging racism in Canada and in ourselves. So good intentions. Um, we all like to believe that we're not racist. Unintended consequences. Racism exists and non-Black, non-Indigenous, non-persons of color benefit from and are complicit in this racism. Systems all around us are built to benefit white settler populations. 
Without intentionally learning, uncovering the layers and working towards right relationship, there will never be sustainable movement toward equity in the land. I do believe this is gonna be a powerful weekend. The panelists who have gathered here to share their realities, their stories and their cultural histories with us are diverse in geography and in experience. They are teachers, they are role models, they are gracious. And there will be things shared that are difficult to hear and that are challenging to know how to respond. We ask that you sit with that discomfort, connect with others who are on this journey and allow it to move you toward action. If at any time you need to take a break, to step away, to gather your thoughts, we encourage you to do so, but please come back. Recently, I saw a conversation on Twitter <clears throat> where someone had said, Canada is not as racist as the US. And a Canadian response to that was, yes, we are. We're just more polite about it. So we will begin our evening with a video by Al Jones entitled, Canada is so polite. It's our hope that this video sets the tone for open, honest conversation throughout the weekend. Enjoy. Canada is so polite. It's like someone bumps into us in the Tim Hortons line and we say sorry. We're always saying sorry. Well, I mean, not to the indigenous people for stealing their land. And Harper only kind of apologized to residential schools while crossing the finger on his hand. And not to Angelique who we hanged. And not to everyone we bombed in Afghanistan. And not for the internment of the Japanese or for the deaths on the railroad built by the Chinese. And not for breaking the treaties or racist immigration policies. But we're so polite. We always say please. Well, not to our migrant workers or imported nannies, but they should get down on their knees because Canada is the promised land. No, there was no slavery, just the Underground Railroad. So forget about the ads for runaway slaves in the Halifax newspapers. Halifax is a safe haven for lazy immigrants who come here and we just give you welfare earned by hardworking white taxpayers because Canada is so white. Just rosy-cheeked white people playing in the snow and the ice. Just snowshoeing and canoeing all day and night. And okay, those things were stolen from indigenous people too, but we invented hockey, right? Oh wait, it was black people who invented the slap shot and butterfly goaltending while we hide that all out of sight. And that's why Canada is so quiet, because everyone in Canada is so nice. And let's not mention the Shelburne race riots or cross burnings or Africville or 1,200 missing and murdered indigenous women, but there's no genocide. It's rude to raise your voice in Canada. So let's just smile. Canadians aren't racist. We're peacekeepers. We're civilized. And Don Cherry's a national icon, but Canadians aren't violent or bigots. That's just hockey fights. Canadians are perky. No, there's no dirty secrets here. Canada is just quirky. Like we say Z and not Z. But if you talk about racism, we'll be like Z. There's no need for that here. Canada is never abusive. Canada is so inclusive. Canada is so inclusive and the proof is that we let other people be here. It's like, I just stole your land and now I'm throwing a party, but you can stand at the back if you show us ID. It's like, I just put you in the hospital, but here, let me start you an IV. It's like, what are you complaining for? You got six weeks of the Book of Negroes on TV. It's like, we're gonna hoard all the toys, but we might just give you one if you ask us nicely. It's like, we. Can could acknowledge that you have things to offer us, but that's not likely. It's like PK Subban. We might let you be on the Olympic hockey team if you just stop being so black. I mean, so cocky. It's not about race. It's about character. We just don't want you to embarrass the country. It's just your attitude. We're not saying anything ugly. I mean, you should realize you're so lucky. There's no history of segregation here. That's why we wear Canadian flags in our backpacks when we travel abroad because Canada has such a good reputation. Okay, we get to travel. You probably don't, but you just don't know how to teach English to those Asians or build houses in Africa. The country, of course, not the continent. Canadians are helpful because Canada is so tolerant, which means we know your culture is worse than ours, but we let you do your primitive things because Canada is so confident, so confident that we know better than you because our way of doing things is just dominant. We even let you wear your hijab. 
unless it's Quebec. It's just unfortunate that your culture makes you so oppressed. It's not about racism, it's just about respect for our shared values. But we like your little costumes. They're so colorful because Canada is multicultural. We just wish that all you people of color could be more punctual. It's just the white culture is just more functional, but we just love diversity. And forget about how a majority of the country votes conservative. It's just amazing that so many different cultures go to our child's nursery. But then we complain when you get an affirmative action bursary. Canada's multicultural as long as you put white people first. We like your food, fun, and fashion, but past that, isn't it kind of like racism in reverse? I mean, it's so unfair how black and native people get free university. We just want to make sure that everyone's worthy because Canada has so much courtesy. We speak English and French. Okay, not perfectly. Okay, most people only know the French words for cereals, but let's not be absurd. This is still an English country or haven't you heard? There's no distinct societies in Canada. And that's why Canada is so bland. Nothing to see here, just miles upon miles of stolen indigenous land. Just fishermen and farmers and fields of wheat because that's Canada's brand. Just fields of wheat and the outdoor ice rinks and all thy sons command. Now there's no guns and violence here, just socialist health care plans. And just ignore the environmental damage of the oil sands because Canada is so grand, so good at perpetuating this international scam, so sincere at pretending there's no blood on our hands because Canada's not like that. Canada's white as a lamb. And those other people, they're so angry. But true Canadians just don't understand. Lynn, it's your turn and we can hear you. We can't see you yet. You can hear me, good. Right now we're going to be having our first panelist. Our first panelist, give you a second, it's Denise Cole. She's a two-spirit lamp protector of mixed Inuit descent from Southern Labrador, now living in Happy Valley, Gloose Bay, Labrador. She is a board member of Grand Riverkeeper Labrador and member of the Labrador Land Protectors. Denise stands in resistance projects that threaten water, land, lives, and cultures. She has been involved in the resistance to the Lower Churchill Hydro Project in Labrador since 2011. This includes numerous nonviolent protection events and campaigns, which she has led to her, sorry, to the communication of court charges while performing ceremony and peaceful acts of resistance. Look forward to hearing from you. All right, that's that's my cue. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, and as said in the uh, introduction, I am here in, in Goose Bay, Labrador, which is uh, the traditional lands of the Innu and the Inuit. And uh, one of my first, as I always sort of do this as my disclaimer, is that I cannot speak for all Inuit people nor Indigenous people. I can only speak uh, for myself and from my experience. And so that's what I what I bring this evening. And I come in a humble way. And certainly, which with much gratitude on, on what we can learn and share together. Uh, so when I was asked to speak, it was uh, okay. So how do I capture the things that I see or have experienced uh, being an Indigenous Two Spirit in uh, this country? And that's a pretty broad, broad <laughs> topic on how you how do you narrow that down into a ten minute conversation. So I'm going to try by hitting on what I feel are sort of some key points within my own uh, life. And uh, the first one that I'm going to, we're going to start with, I'd like you to, uh, I don't know if you saw it on the news, when Trudeau came to Happy Valley Goose Bay and made a formal apology to the survivors and the families of residential schools. That was 2017, so three years ago. So he came. My mother was in that audience uh, as a residential school survivor. And I remember uh, as that was all happening was also uh, as in the introduction, I've been fighting uh, along with many other indigenous and allies, the Lower Churchill Hydro Project that's on our traditional lands and is flowing downstream to many more communities and basically contaminating an entire food web with methylmercury. 
and that we have much science and you know research and knowledge from our elders and knowledge keepers who tell us that that poisoning is real and uh, we also know that mega dams are killers to ecosystems and so at the same time that that was happening we had taken all formal processes to invite our prime minister and the minister of indigenous affairs carolyn bennett as well as our own federal uh, member of parliament yvonne jones to a sharing circle with us at the same time and said like in the spirit of truth and reconciliation please come and sit with us and hear from us on something that's also impacting not just us but the next generations and no matter what process we took in this uh, diplomatic way of doing things, would they agree? We never did hear from our prime minister. We had allies in Ottawa who occupied Carolyn Bennett's office. And in that occupation, they were able to convince her to meet with us. So that was what it took to get her into the sharing circle. So at the, you know, a few hours after our prime minister shed tears and said, never again and apologized and reminded us yet again there's no relationship more important to him than the nation to nation with indigenous peoples that we sat with uh, with minister bennett and with yvonne jones and spoke to how this project violates not only the united nations declarations on the rights of indigenous people in numerous articles but also uh the calls to action of truth and reconciliation and how the, the many parts were not being honored. And then the sheer fact that we are all human beings sitting here trying to talk about how we do not poison people, nor the foods that uh, or the animals that are a part of their ecosystem. You wouldn't think it's a conversation we still need to have, uh, but it is. And, and the response that they gave to us after, you know, 20 so of us shared and cried and gave voice to our stories that they said we can't go backwards this project has already started and so we can't change it now this project is is backed by permits and federal loan guarantees and uh very much a political uh maneuvering for national energy grids and so the idea that they couldn't stop it they couldn't go backwards though they appreciated our hurt i thought what irony and, and sort of hypocrisy really that at the same time that they had apologized for something that they couldn't take back, that they couldn't, you know. And I said to her, I said, so I wonder who it will be in 50 years or so that will come and apologize for this. And will it be with tears in their eyes too? You know, this is an ongoing thing within our country where we get lots of apologies, but very little action. Uh, so just to, to give a little bit of history, so the residential school systems, it also took court action to have that apology come here. You know, they weren't included in the apology that Harper uh, gave with his fingers crossed. You know, we were left out because we had to prove that the, uh, the five residential schools that existed on our lands for decades uh, were really that even though the last residential school, which was in Northwest River, which is a half hour drive from me, closed in 1980. So, you know, when we get this idea about, you know, get over it, those sorts of attitudes of, you know, this was long ago, this wasn't in my time <laughs> very much. And still in our times, because we also have still some of the highest rates of children going into care. And those children who go into care usually leave their communities completely, are disconnected from their culture, lose their language, and very similar to the stories that I have heard from individuals who went back home after residential school, no longer feeling a part of, there are still children who experience the exact same thing right now. And as some of our indigenous groups uh, push for inquiries as to how we have young people who are dying by suicide in group homes, or how is it that we don't have the supports to make sure that kids in care can stay in community? You know, these things are happening today not hundreds of years ago. So I was talking to my mom a little bit about this and about talking tonight. And, uh, you know, we sort of talked about all of these things that, that continues uh, to happen. 
And it made me think of, we talked about the Orange Shirt Day. You know, this year, our province, our provincial government, uh, hugely supported right through their entire school district that everybody got orange shirts and everybody was encouraged to talk. Um, and while I see this is a good thing, this is a part of the reconciliation work that needs to happen, the fact that we need to still have a day and this is not incorporated directly into curriculum and that we don't learn about this. Uh, you know, I have a, a young person that I connect with who graduated last year who is learning more things from having conversations with me about the realities of colonialism and the truths of things that are happening to indigenous peoples in Turtle Island than he ever learned in school. Uh, and he graduated last year. So it's, uh, it's again, how do we wanna talk about this? You know, how do we want to do this work? We have 94 calls to action and truth and reconciliation, yet we still have to fight tooth and nail for every one of them. And they still are moving at a snail's pace you know, we see things happening in certain areas where police show up in droves when it's indigenous peoples who are taking a stand like we saw in 2016 with Muskrat Falls. Uh, but when indigenous peoples are the ones who are being uh, victimized, the response is very different. You know, I remember with 20 of us, most of us, uh, you know, women and elders and children standing against a wall of 150 RCMP officers which were sent from all parts of the country as part of a, a training for them to have an experience of what it was like to be a, a, you know, in a, a protest environment. And I remember looking at people I love on their knees crying as they watched police protect heavy equipment and that those police, as that heavy equipment was being pulled in on tractor trailers, had their hands on their guns. I don't know exactly what they thought we were going to do, but uh, it was certainly an eye opener for me. And when I had plainclothes intelligence officers show up at my doorstep and threaten myself and my dog, um, I was reminded things have not changed as much as I have been told they were. Quite recently, we had our own member of parliament, or sorry, not member of parliament, but our MHA, so our member of House of Assembly, which is our provincial representative. So he was reprimanded because he had made the comment, this is his second comment of such that connected indigenous people where he referenced an Inuk homeless individual who uh, was intoxicated as, it's a shame that he chose that lifestyle with all the supports available to him. And this was in response to the fact that a town constable chose to grab that individual and forcefully and violently throw him down and handcuff him. Um, yeah, these are things I, we live with. So he hasn't been removed from office, but he has now uh, you know, stepped down from that party and is running as an independent and the media quoted him as saying, he's doing this so he can speak more freely not so he can repair the damage that he's done as a white individual in our community who is openly, blatantly making racist comments. So I don't know what Speak More Freely is going to look like. Um, you know, we get lots of apologies, but we still have some of the highest homelessness rates. We have incredible over the top four and five and more times the national level for suicides, for violence, poverty, we still have very poor water quality. I know communities who have been decades with on boil advisories or boil orders, but yet again, when the government wanted to move pieces of equipment for a energy project, again, for the Muskrat Falls Hydro Dam, they made a deal with the community and they fixed up their road, uh, but it's okay for them to not have fresh water. Like, these are things that are just realities. As I was working through this, because I certainly do know people who are trying to work within policies that don't work within systemic government systems that were intended and built to fail, but they're trying to do work. And I do, I, I work and connect with people who hearts are in the right place. And I, I believe that that's part of the restorative justice or the reconciliation work that we need to do. But we're a long way off when we have broken systems and still decision makers who put economics ahead of people and in particular people who are marginalized. You know, these are our lands, yet we are never in a position to have any type of control or say or autonomy. You know, they build indigenous governance systems that are meant to be colonial. 
and uh, you know, and then they tell us to, you know, to get over it, or they tell us that uh, we should be grateful. So uh, there's a lot of work to do, and uh, I'm here because I want to be a part of the team that does the work. You know, part of one of the things I wanted to do, and I was writing up my notes, and I said, well, I like, will I leave it in a positive note? Will I say, you know, we're strong and resilient and beautiful people, but dear God, like we've had to fight. So do I say, do I, do I pull us up because we're so resilient when we've had a nation that's tried so hard to kill us? Like, I think I want to highlight the fact that we have, an, we have a nation that works so hard to kill us. And we need to sit with that. And we need to have that uncomfortable trauma that's been carried on us for generations so that we all can carry it together. And when you carry that kind of trauma, eventually you know you have to take action. If I left you with this idea of, hey, it's all okay, <laughs> it's not. So let's do better. And let this be a place where we can do better. And I'm pretty sure my 10 minutes is up. So thank you, Nakamik. And I look forward to uh, the conversation and the rest of the panelists. Thank you, Denise. That was really powerful. You told us things that I haven't even thought about before. Our next presenter is, gonna, is Husani Raymond, who is a graduate of St. Thomas University in Fredericton. He's co-founder of the Black Lives Matter movement in Fredericton. His advocacy is rooted in a passion for community empowerment and black liberation. During this time at St. Thomas, he's organized numerous inaugural Black History Month events using education advocacy as a tool to address anti-Black racism in his community. During this time with BLMF, Huzoni has led grassroots initiatives related to defunding the police and anti-oppression education advocacy for Black history to be incorporated a new Brunswick public school curriculum. Looking forward to hearing what you have to say, Hugh Sony. Yeah, thank you so much for, for having me and um, thank you so much for sharing your powerful story um, and thoughts with us, Denise. I really resonated with um, a lot of what you were saying. Um, so I'll just talk about briefly um, kind of the, the legacy of colonialism and uh, historic barriers to Black folks here in Canada, um, particularly from an Atlantic perspective, um, and then how that translates to, to present day barriers and marginalization of racialized people in Canada that has often been erased as we watch that presentation, that wonderful poetry by L. Jones talking about Canada is so polite and a lot of these things have been deliberately erase from or history, it's not taught, it's covered up. We hear about the Underground Railroad, everyone knows about that and how Canada rescued um, or slaves, free slaves or free people came to Canada to escape slavery from the United States, but no one learns about residential schools or the history of slavery and segregation that happened right here on this land. Um, and that perpetuates the idea of this multicultural facade of Canada being so inclusive um, and, and it's deliberate why this, these, these things aren't taught um, and that's to maintain that national identity of being the most inclusive nation um, and comparing ourselves to the United States, which honestly is not a very high uh, bar to set for ourselves um, as, as human rights uh, defenders and people who care about the inherent dignity of human beings. So um, I just like to touch on the, the experience or the historical relationship that Black people has had with this land, um, starting with uh, Black loyalists that, that came here um, after the, the American Revolutionary War, um, and they were promised land here in Canada by the British Crown um, if they fought on behalf of the British uh, in, the, in, in the war. However, when, when it came to keeping their promise, again, the state has always been failing Black people and marginalized groups because when they, they came here, majority of them did not get the land that they were, that they were promised um, by the British Crown. And the folks who did get land did not get any quality land in which they were able to sustain themselves. Um, they often had to work for 
for less and were paid less than their white counterparts here. Um, and some black folks came here as slaves with the white loyalists. So you had free blacks who came, came here, um, but then you had blacks who came here as, as slaves um, who still were subjected to, to harsh treatment um, here in Canada. So a lot of people don't even know that slavery existed on this land because that's deliberately uh, not taught, but that was the experience of Black folks. And in fact, a lot of them actually had to leave Atlantic Canada uh, because of the treatment they were, they were receiving um, and, and the harsh realities that they were facing with housing and food insecurity. Um, but even besides slavery, we have a history of segregation here. Um, I know my Nova Scotia folks and Atlantic folks will know about Viola Desmond, who was not able to even sit um, in, in the same area as, as white folks in the movie theater. And we tend to think of these things as, as far away, but in fact, that was only 74 years ago when Viola Desmond was refused um, a seat in the white area of the, of the theater. So in the continuum of human existence, that is not that long ago. That's, we have people here who are six, um, 40, um, sorry, 74 years old. So in our lifetime and in those people's lifetime, we had uh, segregation here in Canada. And the last segregated school in Nova Scotia actually closed um, around uh, 37 years ago. So again, we see that it's not that long ago. So why don't people know about this history and legacy? And I would assert again, that this is in order to continue this, this multicultural facade of inclusivity that L. Jones talked about um, and protecting the, the national identity as you know the, the human rights defenders and the beacon of, of human rights around the world when in fact we do have atrocious human rights violations happening in our own backyard. Um, so, you know, okay, a lot of people like to say this was so long ago, but what does that have to do with the present day, day realities? And I would argue that it's, it's important to, to know and understand these, these historical uh, barriers and, and marginalization of racialized people because it does affect their present day realities. Um, for instance, you know, Black folks are face higher rates of poverty. And that's one thing. It's because there was not an equitable distribution of land or wealth when the Black, from the Black loyalists coming here, but then also segregation from job opportunities. Uh, Queen's University's medical program did not accept Blacks, Black, Black students um, until 60 something years ago. Uh, McGill University excluded black, black students. McGill's uh, the namesake actually owned slaves. Um, so we have these social institutions that are supposed to be meritocratic, but even after slavery, we had the deliberate exclusion um, from participation uh, in these institutions. Therefore, there was no or little to no way for social mobility for racialized people in this country, and that's the present day impact where you have high rates of poverty and violence. Um, but now, because people don't know this historical context, it's easy to look at racialized communities who um, have trauma from colonization um, and have been excluded from participating in, in mainstream society and benefiting um, from, from you know, the development of resources um, and, and judge and think, you know, these people are just not trying enough or working hard enough. But oftentimes Black people are the hardest working people, but they're just not given the, the same equitable access to opportunities uh, that white folks have often been, been granted. Um, and even, even simple things such as the microaggressions that Black folks have to experience on a daily basis um, so microaggressions are kind of, uh, someone describes them as kind of like mosquito bites. You know, if you get one, it's okay. If you get two, all right. But if you get 10 mosquito bites per day, you're trying to have a, a, a nice evening um, in the summer outside and mosquitoes keep swarming you. Um, but Black folks experience that because of the lack of education. They're seen as newcomers here. You know, you have seventh generation Black folks who have been here just as long as white folks, but they're still being asked, where are you from? 
um, as if they haven't been here for generations because there's this deliberate exclusion of the contributions of Black folks um, to what we now know as Canada. Um, and all the positives, all the development, everything good is attributed to the contributions of white folks. Therefore, Canada is seen as, you know, the standard for citizen, a citizen or a, an ideal citizen of Canada is a white person. So even if you your family has been here for generations, you have no accent, you're still being asked, where, where did you come from? As if you are an outsider to this land, you're someone else coming here that we're gracing you with our generosity by allowing you to, to live here and, and come here when in fact, <laughs> you've been here just as long as, as white people. Um, so that's, a, that's another example of how um, the, the deliberate erasure of history and not teaching about the contributions and the history of Black folks contributes to the further marginalization of Black people in the current day. And, you know, a lot of people are just ignorant about a lot of these, these racial issues that I experienced firsthand um, on my university, university campus um, at St. Thomas University, just coming here, um, you know, the, one of the first things I heard on campus was, I expected you to be more gangster or more like a thug, you know, like I've spent my life trying to, you know, carve my own identity and go outside of this box that society continuously puts me in because of stereotypes and how black folk people are portrayed in the media, um, in movies, like everything you consume. And I go first generation university student. And the first thing I hear on campus is, I was expecting you to be more gangster or more of a thug. So these are the type of microaggressions that Black folks have to experience, um, even when they're trying to defy the odds and you know step outside the stereotype. They're still being put inside inside boxes. And I see my time is about to expire, but maybe uh, another time I'll be able to to go into more um, details about some of the things that I touched on here. But um, I just wrap up to say. Uh, thank you so much for, for having me, and I look forward to the Q&A to answer any questions, particularly if anyone has any, I didn't get to really touch on, you know, the criminal justice system and the history, the racist history of the criminal justice system and policing um, and why it's imperative for, you know, us to reallocate police resources into communities um, in order to achieve true Black liberation. And that's not just for Black people, that would be, that would benefit everyone within our society um, because we need to focus and invest in communities and people um, rather than investing in institutions that don't work and further marginalizes and criminalizes racialized people. So that's also something that I could go into uh, later on, but thank you so much. Thank you, Hizani, that was really powerful reflecting upon the whole thing of microaggression, all the little things that continually irritate, that continually tear you down. Very powerful. And now we're going to be hearing from, sorry, Tara Lewis. Hi, my name is uh, Tara Lewis. I'm from Eskasoni First Nations here in Unamagi. Uh, that's in Mi'kmaq territory. Um, yeah, so... I'm fighting a cold, so it's not COVID, it's a cold. I, I'm even grateful that I'm be able to talk this evening. Um, I'm slowly lo losing my voice. I just was on another panel or um, just prior to this one at the webinar uh, talking about the land protectors here. That's been, what's the, the systematic raci racism that's been going on here in Sonerville um on down in south shore nova scotia um so I, i'll just like to begin my story um you know i from the time i was in my mother's womb you know uh there was uh racism um that was uh that happened to my mother i was a twin and my mom miscarried miscarried my my twin uh, when she was at the hospital, she was going to go for um, DNC. And uh, just what happens on the elevator on her way to her, um, uh, 
for her DNC, the um, her uh, specialist was there. And she asked her like, why was she there? That nobody told her, told her special, my mom's specialist why she was there. And she said that, uh, um, that she had miscarriage. So the doctor had to fight with the, um, the nurses for my mother to go for um, an ultrasound. If they have, if they, if the specialist wasn't there at the time, my mom would have, they would have scraped me out of her womb. And that's a lot of things that happens with uh, um, indigenous people here in, in North America um, that we're not taken seriously in the healthcare system. And you could see that what happened with, um, uh, with the young, I, I'm drawing a break with her name right now. I'm just so tired. Um, um, but uh, that happens a lot in, in Canada. And luckily enough, I was able, I mean, you know, God for, thank God for that, um, uh, the specialist to be there. Um, but there's a lot of uh, sterilizations that happens to a lot of Mi'kmaq women, and not, not only Mi'kmaq, indigenous women here in Canada. Um, and you can look through, uh, um, and a lot of it is unknown because we haven't given a platform. There's a lot of shame into it, like for women, you know, that this happened and we're never believed in our, with our stories. Um, so I'd like to also say that, uh, you know, language is also important for us indigenous people. And um, my dad lost his uh, language in residential school. So I have, I'm a survivor. My parents are uh, both survivors of residential school. And they went to school in Shubenacadie, in Shubenacadie. And um, my dad lost his language. My mom uh, still has her language, but she thought, uh, that it was important for me to have English be in my first language, given the fact that uh, her own life experience, having herself being um, first language being Mi'kmaq and having that broken English and looked upon as not being as educated as some and not having a lower, uh, not having a high IQ, which she's very intelligent. Um, so she just felt like maybe that it would have been better for us to learn English. Um, I felt it uh, that microaggression, um, racism in university. And growing up on a reservation, I didn't have to um, deal with racism da daily until I went to university. You know, you, you could tell, you know, once they knew you're indigenous, you could tell just even by the look of you, you're treated differently. Um, and so, but what this one story when I was uh, in my professor's uh, classroom, I mean, no, in his office, I should say, and we're having discussion. And then there was one student younger than me came to his classroom that wanted to quit his course. She was very young, she was younger than me, but intelligent. Um, she had broken English. She couldn't articulate well what she was trying to say. So I spoke for her and I, and I, I convinced her to stay in that, in that classroom because I felt she can do it. And she was a, a friend of mine. Uh, after leaving, um, after, and she decided to stay. And then when she left the, um, uh, the office, the professor told me, he, she, he was like, Tara, you're very articulate. And um, I, at the moment, I thought, thank you, you know. And then when I left his office, I just had this sting. What did he mean by that? It, it just didn't sit right. And I was, I was thinking about it for weeks. I said, did he mean that? I was articulate for an indigenous person because a lot of my people have broken English. And then, and at that, I knew that that girl was very intelligent yet just because she had that broken English was she looked upon as though she wasn't, 
intelligent or wouldn't she have if i was in that room wouldn't she would she have even uh, continued to do his course and i think that's a lot of things that a lot of indigenous people have to face here in uh in canada um you know my time in Solnerville being a frontline um, per, a woman, frontline woman, and most people ask, what are frontline women uh, workers? What are frontline workers? And our job was to keep the peace because, you know, we were getting, it was where we were faced with terrorized action from non-Indigenous fishermen. And you see, People have seen all the videos that were shared. And I was in Solnerville for maybe um, about a month, uh, back and forth from Eskasoni to um, Solnerville. And that was like alone seven hours. And that took a lot of my time. Uh, but being there and facing that racism firsthand, it was a very uh scary um i'm now two weeks home from being from solnerville and you know i i believe a lot of me and my a lot of our frontline workers who are mostly women um suffer from ptsd because we were there in the front lines we we're divided our men and the um, non-indigenous fishermen to, um to keep the peace um, so our men, you know, we were there as peacekeepers we, and we would practice our, our song and our drum, um, you know, our ceremonies. Um, it was, it, it was very traumatic being there and just to, you know, to deal with upfront racism firsthand like it, it was pretty scary I never really de dealt with anything like that before you know there's microaggression racism but like right in your face racism where people were didn't see you as human and didn't care all they cared about was um their own means and they want while we were protecting our fishermen's boats they didn't care at what degree you could felt you could see it in their eyes like if if we're standing in their way you know at what length and you've seen that they they it was they burned buildings like and uh they burned you know it was it was it was crazy being there um a lot of the times people ask a lot of the questions that I guess asked, like, why would you even go to Solnerville? Being a mother, um, you know, being a daughter, why would you put yourself at risk? And seeing my people being treated, uh, how they were treated on Insta, Insta um, on social media broke my heart. And I seen, I seen all those videos unfolding and, I, I, there was this inner voice in me that told me that I had to go. I had to leave my children for days on weeks, just keep on going back and forth and uh, um, just trying to keep the beast and protecting our waters and our lands and our fishermen and our rights. And just for us to be there, you know, to exist. And it's so disgusting that it's happening here in Canada in 2020. And I feel like um, there's always been racism here. And, but I believe that because what's going on in the US is giving people this, um, this uh, safe thing for them to be okay with them acting the way they do uh, so aggressively, to be proud and okay with being ra racist. And to act upon it and to do those terrorist attacks. Those were terrorist attacks that were they were doing for Mi'kmaq fishermen. When I first got there that day at Solnerville, um, 
there was nobody at the wharf. Everybody at the time went to go eat, except there was only four younger women who were protecting the boats. And I was one of them. And uh, they, the men just came in and one by one, they would um, wheel their wheels and just blowing their wheels at us. And, uh, you know, just having these tactics trying to intimidate us. And they were drinking on top of that. And where was the RCMP? <laughs> there was no RCMP. It wasn't until when more videos started uh, towards almost the end of this month or last month, I should say, um, that more RCMP were called in. But if this was the other way around, like have they like in um, in Big Cove in El Sebuktuk and uh, Altingas, the other way around, they, they, they got army men, you know, um, from trying when we are there fighting for our rights to save our lands when it comes to um, pipelines and stuff. But here we are, you know, we're just pra practicing our treaty rights. It's a constitutional law, you know, that, uh, and yet um, we have no protection. And that's just part of a lot of many sy systematic racism that's going on in this country. Um, it, it's sad that like, a lot of people like to believe that we're not like America. And I think that's so ignorant to say, and it's so um, racism, ignorant to say, uh, I just feel a lot of um, white people like to turn a blind, blind eye and like to think that they're not racism. They're not racist. And it's sad because if um, I feel it being, cause I, I'm, I'm very, I'm a person that's, uh, I'm a hiker. I hike all over Cape Breton. I love talking to people and I love my island, but yet I do feel it when I talk to people. And you, you instantly, you can feel it when they first meet you. And once they, I can't hide that I'm not native. I, you know, looking at me, you can tell I'm, uh, I'm indigenous. And, you know, you get that instant, um, that microaggression racism. And, but then I'm here bubbly talking and, you know, and then you could hear after, and I try not to have that stop me from having a conversation with them. And I'll end up, even though if I feel it, I, I still talk to them. And you could hear, you could feel the, um, the, the, the energy changing. And it's like, you know, maybe because my English just isn't so broken, or maybe it just, I'm not the typical stereotype that most uh, white settlers have of indigenous people. There's just such, a divide and it has to do with a lot of times with centralization here in Nova Scotia where we're displaced from from our land into these small communities and there's this you know we don't have to deal with these native people let's just throw them to the side and we don't have to deal with them and we weren't really allowed to leave our, our reservations until a certain time we weren't even allowed to vote and um that the history of racism in Canada, which is in the indigenous people, it's, you know, it, I feel like education is the key with it all. And um, like these fishermen, these non-indigenous fishermen is uh, down in Digby, you know, I felt sorry for them. I felt like they're uneducated and they didn't know about who you, who we were. It felt like, you know, they're telling us, this is our land. And we were like, well, this is Mi'kmaq. This is unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. We never gave up our land. You're on our land. This is our water. This is our resources. And yet, uh, you know, it was sad to hear a lot of the ignorant um, conversations that were going on. 
uh, in Sonerville. Um, but yeah, but I'm I'm going to stop talking because I am losing my voice and I feel like I'm gonna it's breaking up bad. Um, but yeah, I'm going to end on that note. But yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you, Tara. That was very powerful. You may have a sore voice, but you are very articulate in telling us the truth about what you're facing. So thank you very much. Tara Lewis is from Eskazoni First Nation. Unamaki, sorry, I'm having trouble reading, and endured many examples of colonial mindset. She tells us, embrace our Mi'kmaq nature, culture, nature, medical rights, and traditions allowed me to raise seven intelligent, respectful, and independent children. I'm having, sorry, I am a hiking ambassador. I have Umaki promoting my beautiful island through social media, traveling and meeting various people across the world has opened my eyes, heart, and soul towards demonstrating the importance of our protection of Mi'kmaq treaty rights. Thank you so much. So I'll introduce uh, Brittany Drummond, is an African Canadian born and raised in Coal Harbor, Nova Scotia. Throughout her life, Brittany has dealt with racism in its many forms. Uncertain of how to change it, she remained quiet. After recently deciding to go back to school at the age of 28 to study for a paralegal degree, her passion for equality was awakened. She has stepped up as an administrator for the Anti-Racism Ministry of the Anglican Diocese of Nova Scotia and PEI. Her hope is to eventually have some laws of the Criminal Code of Canada changed to better protect minorities. So Brittany, we're pleased to have you and looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Um, I don't know if everybody can hear me all right or if we're good. Sounds good, Brittany. Um, can hear you. Thank, thank you. Um, so yes, uh, I want to dive into kind of give a little bit of background about myself on how I got to where I am today. Um, as mentioned, I did grow up in Coal Harbor. It was a predominantly, still is a predominantly white neighborhood. Um, I think through my entire life, I may have been, if not the only black kid in my class, and there were less than four of us. Um, so that just generally speaks to how white it was. Um, I was also kind of like a victim of, I shouldn't say kind of, I was a victim of bullying um, because of the color of my skin. I did manage to find great friends who accepted who I was as a black person, um, but it did generally get worse as I made it from elementary through junior high to high school where the the thing was that I was either too black for white people or too white for the black people once I got to high school and it was generally I was very well spoken I didn't speak from the streets um as a lot of other uh, black kids in my school may have um, and it didn't just stop in school like I was there's there was racism at work where I would be well overqualified for a job and I would be passed up because now they would never I don't think they'll ever admit it was because of the color of my skin but you know it's there um, I mean I worked for Sobeys for four years and was stuck on a in a cashier position where other employees who came after me were being promoted, even though I was overqualified and ready for supervisory roles and manager positions never happened. And so I unfortunately kept it to myself and I just accepted it as that's what has to happen. And I moved through my life pretty much with that in mind. Um, 
until recently where I have family across Canada and in the States and you see on the news of, the best way to put it is, you see on the news like the police brutality um, and just the mentality that everybody has against Blacks, not even just Blacks, minorities, um, if you're of Mexican, Black, Italian, Chinese, if you're a minor- minority, there's always a, I don't even, I don't know the right word to explain it. There's always a assumption that you're supposed to behave a certain way. And so for me, it was, I could never lose my temper I couldn't show any aggression because that is what they expected of the black people in my neighborhood and my my like in Nova Scotia and Halifax in general we were kind of overlooked as not qualified for anything I mean you can go to all these white neighborhoods they have sidewalks they have properly paved roads and then you go to places like East Preston and they don't, they don't have that. They don't have, they have one, pretty much one main paved road, but a lot of the side streets are full of potholes or gravel. They don't have sidewalks. They don't have street lights. They don't have crosswalks. And it's because they're treated as underprivileged, but they're, the, to me, they're the most blossomed community including Dartmouth and Halifax like that is where to me greatness is coming from and I know that personally because in my family I had one cousin who came from East Preston and she showed the world that she was a a great force to be reckoned with because she became a big basketball star um in hell not just just in Halifax, she played for uh, Team Canada, and she, she showed that even though she came from East Preston, that there was more to her than where she came from, and that's what I want everybody, my, every minority to be able to say that, that they come from more than what we assume that they should be able to do, and so my hope is I'm starting now to work towards getting the government to acknowledge that a lot of the laws in place now, while they are made to serve and protect everybody, there are certain loopholes that could be granted that are designed to hurt minorities. So for example, one of the things that we've, I've uh, been in discussion with because I'm also an administrator for an anti-racism group um, for the diocese, the Anglican Diocese of Nova Scotia and PEI. Um, one of the, the, the discussion was that there was no actual law against hate crimes. But the truth of the matter is, there is in the uh, Criminal Code of Canada. However, where it says that certain people will be prosecuted if they commit a hate crime. There's also a, except unless you fall under this category. And it's so easy for anybody who to commit a hate crime to claim those exceptions and get off the hook. And that is what we need to stop. We need to take away those exceptions. If you commit a hate crime, you need to own up to it. You need to be punished for it. And that's the end of the story to me. So. That is where I'm at right now. I'm trying to get in contact with whoever I can. I want to take it as far up as um, Justin Trudeau if I have to, but I want to. I want to get this changed, and I I'm asking. I mean, if you you guys want to be involved, that's where we have to start. Is we have to start challenging the laws and challenging our government officials to say that there's too many loopholes that allow people to get off on their crimes.
And I think that's really all I have to say on this. Uh, I'm just gonna bring up quickly uh, the list of the exceptions. Oh, it's I know most of it off by heart because I've been trying to not only get it changed, but wrap my head around it myself. Um, but one of the major exceptions is you will not get charged for hate crimes if you claim and can prove it's against your religion. Because I'll take the Christianity, Anglican religion, for example. In the Bible, there are certain rules and expectations, and especially like against gay marriage that we're still trying to interpret the right way. And so, I mean, someone can make a hate crime against a gay couple and say, it was in my religion and that's why I did it. And it literally will hold up in court as a, as a, as, I don't know the word I'm looking for, but like as the exception and that, will allow them to I'm hoping in most cases it's judge and jury but I mean it gives them a, a great case to get off of whatever um charge they're they're being charged for I'm just trying to find the whole list I had it bookmarked and now I can't find it so maybe Brittany um we'll let uh Lid moderate a more questions and if you uh, have that uh, when you find a good link you could put it in the chat to share with folks mm -hmm. does anyone have any questions that they would like to share so feel free to address your question to a particular person Elizabeth I wonder if it would be a good moment to give people the questions before we dive deep into the Q&A, the questions we want everybody to think about for tomorrow. Uh, sure. <laughs> so how do we feel about what we've heard? What action might we take? Considering race relations in Canada, what does truth look like to you or to us? What does truth look like as we consider race relations in our country and in our own daily lives. Um, so Laura Hunter asks, I'm curious what the current status of the Muskrat Falls Dam is. Are the land protectors still active? Denise, would you be able to speak to that? Absolutely. And uh, well, the long and the short is the status of the project is that it's continuing. Uh, it is not quite operational yet. Uh, there has been a few different issues, uh, but they have done a really good job of using both the Supreme Court and Provincial Court to lock up a lot of individuals into court systems with civil and criminal charges for the protection work that we were doing. And uh, most of those charges actually took close to four years to, and the majority of them were uh, thrown out or found not guilty, but it was a really good tactic to make people afraid to continue in the protest work. And once the company brought the injunction in place and that was being reinforced by, by police, including, like I said, those 150 that came in, um, we are active in different ways. What I'm doing right now as a part of that action, us continuing to bring forward the voice we have uh, joined up with some uh, like Dam Watch International and with Tiskatan out of uh, Manitoba. And uh, we continue to work and create allies because the Lower Churchill Project is two phases. The first phase was Muskrat Falls. The second phase is Gull Island. So we're still working actively, including uh, with Grand River Keeper Labrador. You can find us on Facebook. There's also on the website for Grand River Keeper Labrador. And uh, we're doing things like we do have an education subcommittee that's uh, doing different webinars or speaking engagements and trying to build up momentum. Uh, we also have a training subcommittee and, and are looking at launching a 10-day canoe trip down the river next year. Uh, so yeah, we are still doing things because uh, water is our lifeblood and the lifeblood of Mother Earth. So we, 
you know, protection is not something you do just for protest. It is a way that we live. And, uh, and that's the difference of, uh, you know, of sometimes people see the case of this is the justice cause we're on. No, this is a way of life. And it's my responsibility uh, as a two-spirit indigenous person on these lands to not just bring voice to my ancestors, but protection for the next generation. So uh, we will always be active. But not gonna make a good question. Thank you, Laura. Thanks, Denise. Thanks for sharing all of that work that you're doing. I'm gonna to try to pass it around to the various panelists. And so there was a question for Sony as well, and uh, hoping you could talk a little more about the defunding of police and what that could look like in Canada um, versus the US structures and systems. What could that look like in Canada? Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> first we have to acknowledge that there's police and state violence here in Canada as well. Um, just this year, we had two Indigenous folks that were murdered um, by police here in, in New Brunswick. Um, so it's, and in Toronto, you know, there's a lot of carding. And even in Halifax, there was um, reports of, of carding and police brutality. And I think that stems from the, the inherent idea that Black folk and ra racialized folks in general are, are inherently more criminal or prone to criminal activity. Thus, our communities are, are over police and then subsequently resulting in, in higher participation or higher rates of uh, arrest and criminalization um, and overrepresentation in the criminal justice system um, and prisons. So I just like to give that context and also to note that that policing, um, a lot of these policing institutions were founded on racist ideals and actually enforce uh, the, the, the rules of the, the slave owners and the colonizers. For instance, in the United States, um, the first form of police forces were actually used as slave patrol to capture slaves who were just trying to be free from, from um, cruel and unusual punishment and exploitation of their labor. Um, here, here in Canada, the RCMP was founded on policing indigenous communities um, when indigenous people weren't allowed to leave their, their reserves without you know, official authorization. It was the RCMP that would police them. And if someone would see an indigenous person, they'd call the RCMP on them to you know, check to see if they had permission to be off their reserves. So you have to understand that this history of policing racialized neighborhoods, there's already this inherent distrust um, and again, this is all the thing, these things aren't that long ago, um, within a generation or two. So um, we have to recognize that. And also that the police have never meant safety for some communities. For some communities, um, racialized communities in particular, the police have always meant violence because they've all, the police have always been called on them to protect um, white people. If you were uh, on social media, active on social media earlier this year, you saw the white lady in New York who is a Canadian and how she weaponized her whiteness when she called the police. She deliberately talked about this black man is threatening me when the guy was literally just standing there and telling her to put her dog on a leash. But that's because a lot of white people know that when they call the police, the police is inherently unsafe for racialized people and will defend the interests of the, the white individual because they're always seen as the innocent. And even in present day examples, as Tara has pointed out, um, and Denise, in you know, when, when there's violence against racialized people, the police stay neutral and don't want to get involved or protect the, the perpetrator of the violence. But if um, people, racialized people stand up for their inherent rights, such as to be free from slavery or their inherent right to fish or any of these, their right to, to, to freedom of movement, you know, police were used by the state to actually combat their liberation. So putting that, that history out there um, to contextualize what, I'll about, what I'm about to say next, that um, one, police have never meant safety for a lot, of, uh, a lot of our communities, but also police are ineffective in preventing crime. So we call police when a crime has already been committed. There's a violent crime we call the police, or, or 
um, we call the police on the most vulnerable in our in our society, people with mental health issues, um, instead of investing in, you know, adequate mental health services, we invest in police to arrest and harass mental health uh, people in mental health crisis. Instead of investing in affordable housing, we invest in the police to call the police on people who don't have somewhere to sleep. I am um, in conversations with the local police force and you know, one of the guys told, told me that oftentimes banks call them from in Toronto and say, get this homeless person out of the ATM in the dead of winter. So again, we think police are the solutions to, to all our problems. And we call the police on, on people. What's, what's the police going to do? The police is not going to solve homelessness. They're just going to take this human with inherent dignity out and put them out in the cold to freeze or lock them up in jail and further criminalize them when we could invest that money that we're investing in this institution that's not working to invest in community, investing affordable housing, investing in mental health supports, um, investing in, in adequate food services, um, you know, people stealing food and we call the police, lock them up, criminalize them. Why don't we think, why are people, why are we in a society with so much abundance that we have people who are going without basic food. Obviously, if you don't have food, you're not thinking long term, you're thinking, how can I get food today? So why don't we invest in making sure that everyone has their basic needs met? And research shows that investing in communities in these ways, investing in, you know, proactive means of crime prevention, such as housing, mental health support, addiction support, food and clothing um, security, uh, and when people's needs are met, they're more, they're less likely to commit crimes. So that's what defunding the, the police is about. Even in, in both the Canadian and the US context, it's about shifting from investing in um, the system that criminalizes people and uh, criminalizes poor people, criminalizes racial people, and see them as the enemy and a threat. And that doesn't do anything but lock them up and brutalize them and subject them to violence when we could shift that money and investing it into preventative things, preventative crime prevention. So if homelessness is a problem, invest in homelessness, not in police to arrest the homeless. So that's the, that's the, the premise. And also I'd like to note that this is not just for black folks. Um, defunding the police won't just benefit black and, and, and indigenous communities or people of color. It will benefit everyone because these services will be made available for everyone. And it's for or collective um, liberation and freedom and everyone being able to live a life of, of dignity. So I think it sounds radical, but when you interrogate it, um, it, it sounds like a logical solution, you know, but sorry, is my time being finished? I'll, I'll, I'll uh, okay. <laughs> I to, uh, just to thank to that, uh, the idea of how the RCMP are, are being used as corporate security. Like we have so many projects that are happening throughout our nation, whether it's within West Oton and the pipelines or when fracking within in New Brunswick, uh, us with Muskrat Falls, it's that huge amounts of money and resources are now going into the RCMP to make them very accessible for corporations to bring in court injunctions and the first response is RCMP in massive amounts. And the amount of money, like I know here there was that shutdown in Muskrat Falls for the you know 11 days or whatever it was and they put a price tag to what they said the protesters cost the company in stoppage but did not in turn tell us the millions that were spent in sending, you know, close to 500 RCMP into our communities. Like, so there, there's a huge amount of money that's going into RCMP to break up blockades on railways, to uh, force pipelines to get through. Like, so it's, uh, and as we've seen different movements uh, that have happened within our urban settings, it's who do we see come out in droves? It's the RCMP. So uh, I'm with you, Hassani. That's exactly what we need to be doing. <laughs> And it and it begs the question: Who is the police serving and protecting? Is it the is it the vulnerable? It's, is it us or is it whoever has the most power to to tell them what to do? Um, so I think all are are civil liberties. And the last thing I'll say: I know my time is finished, <laughs> but this is not to say there won't be a role in our society. For instance, for people who investigate crime, that might be a role. Um, there might be a role for people who 
I'll put quotations over crime, there might be a role for people who, when there are serious instances or threats, there might be a role for a certain group of, a small group of people to do that. But right now we have this massive budget. For City of Fredericton invests over 20 million in, in policing, but less than half a million in affordable housing and police. So reducing the scope of these people to a small thing to focus on what they're actually might be good at or purpose, they might have a purpose there, um, but shifting most of that money back into communities and that's what will, will solve um, issues of crime. Thank you both. And I wanna give Tara and Brittany another chance yet, but Elizabeth has something to say. Oh, thank you all. Thank you to the panelists for sharing in your, your own fabulous, clear story piece. And um, we're gonna hang around for a few more minutes for those of you who would like to, but I also want to encourage folk to take the questions, take what you've heard, and if you need to leave the meeting, please feel free to leave the meeting. And uh, if you want to stay and continue in conversation, let's do so for a few more minutes. And then we will all come to the time when we say, thank you. This has been fabulous. But we need to call it a night and, and gather again tomorrow afternoon at 3 o'clock we're going to gather again and uh, have some more conversation. So thank I saw, you. I saw a question in, in the chat requesting the um, questions to the group be emailed out and I can do that after the end of this evening. In reforming the hate speech law, how would you overcome the obstacle posed by the freedom of speech claim? So in the Charter of uh, Rights and Freedom, it actually will say, I believe, um, that hate crime, uh, no, sorry, it says everyone has the following fundamental freedoms, freedom of conscience and religion, freedom of thought, belief, opinion, expression, including the freedom of the press and other media of communication, freedom of peaceful assembly and freedom of association. But there is a, within the government, they do allow them to enforce some limit um, and hate speech, obscenities and defamation are common categories of restricted speech in Canada. So if it can, like if it does come to like hate speech, covered under the fundamental freedom or the freedom of expression. Thanks, Brittany. Are you still with us? Having a little internet connection. No, trouble. there's noises outside my apartment and I don't know what they are. <laughs> could, I, could I add to that just briefly that it's question fireworks. To, to hate speech? Um, so I think in, in some, the, the idea is everyone has rights, but there are also no right is absolute. And there's also, you know, responsibilities with those rights and the repercussions that come from those. So um, you might have the right to say stuff, but that doesn't mean that if you go beyond a certain point, the government doesn't have the authority to put certain limitations um, on what you're you're allowed to say, which is in this case, hate speech goes beyond um, that reasonable limit, which is why it's it's um, a criminal um, or can be a criminal offense. Thanks, Susanna. And then there was one more question I wanted to address, and then I'm going to jump off. Um, it's from. Meryl, I don't know if I, I don't know if she's still in here. Oh yeah, I see her. Um, she, she asked quite a number of questions. Do you want to maybe just summarize a little bit about your experience with that group? Yeah, um, so believe it or not, the group that I'm a part of was actually started by a group of white people. Then they 
brought me on um, kind of just to make sure that they're not overstepping any boundaries. Um, but our goal is to make churches in the Anglican faith a little bit more diverse. Um, and I'm, it's not just like diverse for Black people or anything. It's diverse against or diverse for minorities. Um, the church that I go to, though, is amazing. I've been going steadily for God, 23 years now, give or take, <laughs> since 1997. Um, and they've always have accepted and included um, me, not just based on my, like my color. We have hymns like we have a south african creed hymn that we sing once a month almost once a month um they do recognize black history month and there's i can't even like get into it all about what they how they made me feel included um but they also supported i did start a second where we watch um right now we're watching a movie called the hate you give um, and then after the movie, I lead a discussion on the movies about like police brutality against African um, Americans. So I lead kind of like a discussion based on like how we can change kind of like what we're doing tonight, how we can be better allies for those who have to face this on an on a daily basis, um, not just in the states but in Canada. And I mean, when I brought that program forward in my church, they were eager to get something started. And so, like, it's it might be hard, but it's I guess it's just the approach on how you want to start it. And I mean, if you do have something that you want to start within your own church, Meryl, um, you can email me and I'd be more than help, happy to like help get something started for you. Um, that goes to anybody. I, I'm always, I'm not like a pro at it, but <laughs> I'm always willing to at least try. I want, I mean, there are some people myself a bubble and you know ignore what's going on in the world because sometimes it can be too much but I want to get that out there that you know there is a room for change I hope that answers your question thanks Brittany um I wanted to um also direct a question to Tara um, so Tara, I'm not seeing all of, there you are, you are still with us. Are you ready to take a, a question? I'm still here. There, there um, what was the question? Was, there was a question earlier about education and, um, mm -hmm. and if you were able to say a little bit more about that, but I was also thinking about the, the first two questions that went to, um, Denise and Husoni, uh, a question of where are things currently? If you are able to say a little bit more about the, the current situation in Somerville and, and with the Fishers, um, what's, what's continuing to happen, but also what's your sense of um, po uh, policing in that situation? Um, and what what's your perspective on on policing and what could make the situation better so that's kind of three questions in one i'll let you start where you want <laughs> um the current situation in solnaville right now is uh our Mi'kmaq fishermen are still fishing um there's been recent news that member two bought clear water so that's going to be a lot of the non-native um, fishermen's bosses is going to be um, Mi'kmaq people. 
Um, we don't know too much of it right now, so especially myself. So there's more details to come in the future about everything right now. Um, I'm very pleased to hear about that. Um, and it's something to look forward to. There, uh, I, it's been two weeks since I've been away from Solnerville. It has been quiet down since the last time I left. Um, especially, uh, there hasn't been that many, um, um, terrorists, I call them a terrorist attacks on our Mi'kmaq fishermen, but they have, uh, I know with the fishermen, uh, well, with the frontliners and people who are, um, protecting our fishermen on land. But on um, water, I believe that um, there's, there, uh, the fishermen gears are be still being cut and hauled. Um, so, and that's been, you know, ongoing for decades now. Uh, I've heard a lot of stories about a lot of fishermen, generation after generation, that it's been this has been ongoing. It's just been more so um, spoken about just through social media and that we as uh, indigenous people, we have our phones that can cover this uh, situation that's going down in Solnerville, the uh, race, racism tactics that's been going on down there. Ever since the injunction that has been placed about three weeks to go, a lot of it has quieted down. So with the injunction, it's, it, it made history being that indigenous people having to place the injunction. Usually it's against us, especially when it comes to pipelines and stuff like that. Companies place injunctions with us when we're protesting to protect our lands. This is uh, Solonville made history with the Mi'kmaq fishermen placing an injunction to protect the wharf and the people. Uh, so, um, you know, history was being made there. Um, and what were the other questions? Sorry, it's getting late. I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> it is getting late, and we will be wrapping oh, up about for the air. Yeah, for the hour. Oh, and education. There's education. Um, I believe that we, as Indigenous people, we shouldn't have to educate people. It, it, you know, we're busy with our lives. It's it's hard to just, you know, having to give that. Res I feel like sometimes we place that responsibility in our hands, and it shouldn't be the case. Uh, education should have already been established. You know, uh, Canada's sovereignty to protecting its national image. So this is where it stems from. Uh, so we need we need our um, you know we need to look on our leaders. Uh, we need to fund more programs for um, and hire to First Nation people to to educate people. I know a lot of I my friend who is white told me he never learned about um, indigenous uh, history or anything about indigenous people until he was 23 in university. 23 in university. I mean, to learn about First Nation people in Canada, like, I couldn't believe it. And we're neighbors. I'm from Eskazoni. He's from across the lake in East Bay. In near Big Pond, so it's like, uh, and that's only about sixty kilometers away. So he never knew; he was never educated in middle school or in high school about um, um, indigenous history, and you know. But yeah, it's uh, there needs we need to look on our leaders to get the funding here in across Canada in. It needs to be taught early in middle school and as early as middle school. Um, yeah, so that's that's what I got to say about that. <laughs> I'm losing, I'm literally losing my voice. <laughs> Thank you, Tara. Thank you so much to all the mm. panelists.
Um, I'm not sure that we've covered all the questions, but we perhaps covered as much as we can in one evening. Elizabeth, do you have some closing words for us? <laughs> well, I, I'm kind of uh, um, feeling overwhelmed with a whole set of, of feelings and emotions and pondering and like, what now? <laughs> what next? What to do? Um, and so I, I hope that when we gather tomorrow, that we will be able to um, come together and have a have further conversation about what does this mean? This conversation, what we've heard this evening, what does it mean? What does it mean um, for me? What does it mean for us as uh, Canadians? And, you know, uh, I listen to that L. Jones and it makes me uh, mad. <laughs> because I've had that experience of being a polite Canadian, <laughs> you know, and without any thought, uh, just be. So, but I want to encourage us all to, to take what we've heard and let it sit and rest with us while we rest and come back um, if we're able tomorrow afternoon and continue the conversation and be willing to engage in what it means to be, um, for some of us, allies. What does that mean? And how do we do that? So thank you to the panelists for your sharing so honestly and openly with us. And thank you to all of you who joined us in community this evening. And let's um, come back tomorrow. And yes, we're to and hold, hold on folks, because we are blessed to have all of our panelists back tomorrow. And Denise Cole has uh, offered to close us in a good way. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, part of my responsibilities is, is to hold ceremony. And so as I'm listening to this happen, I know we've opened up many doors and uh, it can be heavy. Uh, the work that we do when Tara talked about the front line, right? That's that's very much, we, we hold these gifts and then we share these gifts. And so with all of this, when you're, because what we're doing is opening up trauma. And when we open up trauma, other trauma that all of us experience, it's in our blood memory, if it's not in our direct memory. And uh, so I just would like to ask, you know, Creator and Mother Earth to hold us all closely this evening and to allow us to close those doors and to uh, cleanse our hearts and cleanse our minds and to bring us tomorrow with ears open and in a way of sharing. And to know that when we come into this circle, it's because we all collectively want to create something better for the next generations. So that we can hold the pain, but we can also hold the healing. Uh, so I just ask that Creator be with us and uh, to thank everyone for their energy and their sharing and putting their hearts out in such a, uh, a beautiful but powerful way and that I ask the Creator holds us all closely and brings us all back again safely tomorrow. Um, Nakamik, thank you and blessings and good energy, light and love. Uh, and just very grateful to be uh, in the circle with you all.